Dark and Fergus. Track points play a vital role in the yarn. They stop runaways from colliding with trains on the main line. They went mostly unused, but if the need arose, they could derail runaway trucks, coaches, and even engines, as poor Duck found out. Duck had been working with a trainee driver who was keen to learn, and not just about driving the engines. He was eager for his tea break, which was really a chance to shadow the station master. In his haste to leave, he hadn't put the brakes on properly, and Duck began rolling backwards. He shut his eyes as his weight had shifted, his wheels left the rails, and he came to a halt. Duck was thankful the trap points had done their job, but he was less thankful for the engine that came to his rescue. If this is the Great Western Ray, colour me unimpressed, huff Fergus. It wasn't my fault, scowled Duck. Anyhow, it couldn't have been much worse if not for those trap points. If you'd been doing it right, retorted Fergus, you wouldn't have needed trap points. They're just an excuse for your blunders. Duck was furious. Once he had been re-railed, he stormed off to the sheds. Where does he get all of that do-it-right nonsense? That's the pot calling the kettle black if I ever heard it, chuckled Donald. What do you mean? asked Duck. You have to admit it, replied Douglas. So no far cry you believe about the Great Western Way. The Great Western Way, huffed Duck, is about common sense. Fergus's way is nothing but dangerous perfectionism. He never approves of anyone's work but his own. The twins couldn't argue with that. Fergus certainly wasn't easy to please. Duck was hard at work for several days afterwards. The driver wanted to make up for his mistake. Duck wanted to show Fergus a thing or two. This was easier said than done, however. A bit smoother when buffing up to those trucks, Mr. Duck, Fergus called. Do it right, he said from across the yard. Duck took no notice and started off towards the station. And mind those trap points, I've yard to sort out a no time for rescues, added Fergus. Duck ignored this remark. Fergus huffed indignantly. I don't know, these younger engines, he grumbled to the trucks. No discipline, I tell you. The trucks, who much preferred Duck to Fergus, ignored him. Later, Duck's driver took another tea break, and this time to watch the yard signalman. Fergus was shunting close by. The driver watched as levers were pulled, points were changed, and Fergus rolled smoothly towards the trucks. That's right, that's right, that's right, Fergus smiled proudly. The driver noticed the lever that seemed to be untouched. Hey, what does this do? He asked, grabbing hold and giving it a pull. Don't, Don't touch that, cried the signalman. It's... Fergus was backing out of the siding with some vans when he swerved suddenly. Oh, stop, he cried. The vans crossed over Fergus's treatment of duck and saw their chance. Go on, go on, they cried and pushed him along right off the rails. Ouch, he cried as the vans howled with laughter. Though the trap points are normally worked by powerful springs, they could be operated by the signalman if necessary. The driver had done just that and sent poor Fergus off the rails. Out, 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 yelled the signalman, shooing him out of the signal box. The driver got back to duck just as the yard manager arrived. Get steam up quick as you can. That good strain is due out soon and needs sorting. What about Fergus? asked Duck. I'll leave him where he is. We'll deal with him later, replied the yard manager. Duck set to work at once. The driver was extra careful and they worked quickly to sort out the train. He said nothing as he left for the station. Fergus felt foolish, laying by the line side. Other engines laughed as they passed. He certainly didn't feel he was doing it right anymore. Eventually, efforts began to get Fergus back on the rails. Duck stood nearby, ready to help. 
is that you, Fergus? I'm surprised. I thought trap points were just excuses for slipping up, but you'd never do that. Oh, I'm sorry, blushed Fergus. I suppose we can't always prevent our little, uh, incidents. Never you mind, smiled Duck. If you ask me, admitting you were wrong is very great Western indeed. The two engines chuckled as Fergus was brought safely back onto the rails. Both engines are now firm friends. Duck's new driver decided learning other aspects of the railway was too distracting. He became a good driver and there were no further trap point mishaps. Fergus gives a hearty whistle whenever he sees Duck in the yard, and there was no more talk of doing it right, at least not to the Great Western Engine. Signal boxes and tenders don't mix, called Fergus as Donald backed into a siding. Do it right! Okay, fumed Donald. Duck just had to laugh. Sandy takes a gander. Work on maintaining the line was considered of high importance to the fat controller. Special engines and vehicles were used to make this happen, and each of them had integral roles. The railway had recently brought a track inspection trolley to join the team. Her name was Sandy, and she was keen to make a good impression. <coughs> Sandy rolled into the Sodor Search and Rescue Centre that morning to greet everybody. The centre was home to various vehicles and machines that were useful in times of crisis and whenever an emergency arose. What kinds of special jobs are you doing today? She asked Rocky the Crane. Oh, you know, there's always loads for me to lift, or whenever an engine comes off the line, I have to come to their rescue. Suddenly, the alarm bell echoed throughout the yard. There's a fire at Kirk Mackin. Wilfred and Coldy are trapped in their shed. Right, assured Fire Flynn, and his engine roared into life. Sandy watched as the big red fire engine sped away into the distance. Bell poked out of the shed as she saw the little trolley looking glum. What's gotten you down? Everybody seems to have such exciting jobs, but I don't know what mine is. She sighed and her whole undercarriage let down like a deflating balloon. Well, you never know what could happen. I never know when I'm needed for a job. Sometimes I'm sitting in my shed for weeks before there's a fire, which is probably a good thing, but it does make me feel a little bit redundant at the worst of times. <coughs> Sandy felt a little better as she went back on her way to her usual work. Her driver, Young Phil, knew that she was down. Young Phil was new to the job, so was still learning about Sandy. Why don't we go to one of my favourite resting places? It might make you feel better. They strode down Edward's branch line and found a siding next to a lake where people were fishing and a gaggle of geese were playing around in the water. I find the geese are great when I need some time away from people but still feel I need company, remarked young Phil as he opened up a bag of rolled oats to feed them. He cracked open his flask to make a cup of tea and sat on Sandy's platform as they watched the serene countryside. Suddenly, he noticed something. Where's Honka? Who's Honka? 
One of them is missing, remarked Phil. There's one that normally has a hobble in its leg. He's normally the first to come up and say hello. Sandy was upset that her driver's friend had disappeared. Hopefully he's back here tomorrow, said young Phil, and he turned on Sandy's ignition as they rolled away. But Honka was nowhere to be seen the next day. Or the next. Even the next. Both Sandy and young Phil were disappointed. Come on, he said. Let's get on with the day. Sandy spent the early mornings and the early evenings completing routine track inspection, ensuring that there were no obstructions on the line. Once they gave the all clear to railway operations, engines were allowed to continue with their work. Because the railway was so busy, this check was completed in between stations so all trains didn't need to stop. Devious Diesel used to be one of these engines and was most pleased that he didn't have to do it anymore. That's all you trolleys are good for, <laughs> he sneered as he pulled his train out of the docks. Don't pay attention to him. That diesel has a bad reputation for being particularly rude, sympathised Phil. Sandy rolled into the main dockyard, where she saw three tall cranes hard at work. One turned down to look at her and harumphed. Be careful where you go, little thing. Someone as small as you would almost certainly be lost in our vision. The yellow crane in the middle swung around and darted a look at the one who had just spoken. Sorry about him, Chuck, put in Carly the crane. He lacks common courtesy at the best of times. Cranky the crane said nothing and continued on with his work. Suddenly, there was a rambunctious noise that caught Sandy's attention. A flash of white darted across the dockside and passed a building. Sandy thought she knew what it could be. Phil, Phil, she cried. Did you see that? Young Phil looked up. What are you talking about? It was a goose. I don't think it was a goose, Sandy. You probably mistook Salty's horn for it or a nearby ship. I know what I heard and it was a goose. Carly the crane looked down and could see that Sandy was upset. She chimed in. I think I heard it too. Sandy had an idea. Can you see if you could spot it from where you're standing? I can give it a fair try, Chuck. So Carly studied the dockyard carefully. The only movement she could see was that of engines and machines. And once again, she saw a small white object darting around the yard as workers toppled over in its path. There it is, Chuck. It's a goose, all right. I think it's got a limp as well. Sandy gasped. Oh, that must be Honka! So Sandy zoomed across the other side, desperate to find her driver's friend. Workmen were trying to capture the goose, but it hissed at them. He's agitated, said young Phil. We need to get up to him quickly, said Sandy. No, darted Phil. Remember what we've always done. We need to approach them slowly and quietly. So Sandy simmered her motor and drifted slowly towards the goose, as young Phil made hushed noises to get its attention. The goose turned around and slowly hobbled towards Sandy and young Phil. Oh Honka, said young Phil, and Honka honked happily. If it wasn't for you and Carly, we would have missed him completely. Sandy beamed. You can always rely on us. Hey Chuck, Carly piped. We make a fine pair, actually, fixing everybody's problems for them. You can call us the Fix-It crew, Sandy suggested gleefully. Sandy was happy to have made a first proper rescue, and Honker rode in her cab back to the lake where he belonged. From that day on, Sandy and Carly became firm friends, and were sure to greet each other whenever they saw one another working. Sandy did a fine job on the Sodor Railway Repair Team and even opted in a few opportunities when she was needed at the Search and Rescue Centre. She even helped out some new friends on the road. But that's another story.
Big Bully Bulgy. Sandy was happy that she finally found her footing on the North Western Railway. She spent many early mornings checking the line to make sure everything was safe and helping out the search and rescue team when necessary. She was heading back to Knapford Station one morning after completing her run on Thomas's branch line when she was just about to pass the bus depot. She shifted onto the main line just as Gordon thundered by with the express. Get out of the way, little trolley. Express coming through. Sandy was frightened. You're so small that Gordon could have almost had you fly off the rails, guffawed Bulgy the double-decker bus. He stood proud and tall while making Sandy feel very small. What's such a tiny thing like you doing on the railway? You ought to be on a toy line. I'm not a toy, fumed Sandy. You're the one who sounds like a pip squeak, laughed Bulgy as he turned on his ignition and rolled away. Sandy slowly rolled into Napford Station, her confidence left behind. Oh Sandy, are you alright? asked Emily. It's fine, Sandy replied. It doesn't look it. You look like someone squashed the life out of you. So Sandy decided to tell Emily what happened with Bulgy moments before. Take no notice of him. Bulgy is a mean scarlet deceiver. Sandy took Emily's words into account, but she still felt awful. Bulgy was busier than ever. He was put on a new bus route that week, taking passengers to Vickerstown. He strode into his stop at Forfin, where he met George the Steamroller, who was mumbling curses to himself. What's gotten you all heated up? It's those righty rail raiders. First they take up half the island, and now they're taking the roads. Those steamers can't go on the roads. Oh, but they are. You go to Vickerstown and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Bulgy did see. Nelson, the transporter, had his low loader filled with piles of rails. Men were embedding them into the roads throughout the streets. What's going on here then? barked Bulgy. Haven't you heard about the new line? remarked Nelson. Those big puffballs aren't going anywhere near the roads, are they? Nelson was coy. You'll just have to wait and see. After his service, Bulgy went back to find George. <coughs> I told you, didn't I? pouted the steamroller. Well, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what, I have an idea. And George whispered his plan to Bulgy. <coughs> the next morning, Sandy was taking on her routine inspection across the main line just as dawn broke. The fat controller has a rather different job for us today, started young Phil. And what might that be? Sandy quizzed. There's a new stretch of line that's been built and they need an engine to give it a trial run. I wonder who will be responsible, she thought. Well, started Phil, the fact controller has asked if we can do it. Apparently we're the only suitable thing on wheels. <laughs> when they arrived at Vickerstown, Rocky lifted Sandy off the tracks and onto the new road rails. Well, oh, bless me. I can understand why now. It's a tramway. Toby was considered, but they wanted a smaller vehicle so as not to disrupt the road traffic. So you were the strongest candidate, said young Phil. Sandy did feel special that she was chosen to test the new tramway. <laughs> Thank you.
She happily simmered along, but her joy was soon put to a halt. George the steamroller slank along in front of her, deliberately going at a slow pace. Ray Ray's no good, turn him into roach. Pull him up, turn him into roach. Ray Ray's no good, turn him into roach. Pull him up, turn him into roach. <laughs> Keep moving, you, she scowled as she blasted her horn. So George did move, but only where the rails gave way. Sandy rolled onto the road with a crunch and Phil slammed on her brakes. The fat controller was cross when he found out what happened. You will fix these rails that you obstructed, and you'll be banned from entering this part of the island until further notice. George rolled grumpily away to his yard, but nobody had suspected Bulgy's involvement. It took some time for the workmen to fix the rails, but when they did, Sandy was off again. On her way, she heard a honk honk of a car. A little red vehicle strode up alongside her that looked a little bit like a steam engine. Hello there, chimed Cleo. Oh, hello, my name is Sandy. Who are you? I'm Cleo. Nice to meet ya. Fancy a race? Sandy knew that she had to take her pace slowly, but was entertained by Cleo's proposition. You're on, she said, and at the utter of Sandy's words, Cleo flew ahead like a cork coming out of a bottle. <laughs> Chased after her and rounded a bend. Cars and lorries beeped furiously as the pair whizzed ahead. The two soon reached the end of the route and slammed on their brakes to stop. <coughs> Young Phil and Cleo's driver, Ruth, were not impressed. A stern figure came to approach the pair. Sandy, I trusted you to be careful and cautious with this trial run, but it seems as though you failed me. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, Sandy said glumly. It's just as well that the line has no more obstructions. It should be safe for operation soon enough. As the fat controller left, a low-toned laugh echoed from a distance away. Bulgy, the double-decker bus, strode alongside Cleo and Sandy. I knew it from day dot, Cleo. You're so reckless that you belong on the rails, not the road. You can talk. Snarked Sandy. Call yourself a railway bus. You seem more anti-rail than anything. Bulgy fumed. Sandy had to make her way back to Vickerstown to get back on her own rails, so Cleo came alongside her. <coughs> Thank you for sticking up for me back there. That's alright. It's the least I could do to get one in the headlight for that big red mini. And the two new friends laughed together as they neared the station. Bulgy was still grumbling to himself as he got ready for his return trip home, but that quickly became the least of his worries as a sound he had never heard on the road before came up to him. Oi, who are you? The name's Travis. Driver's still finding my paces, but I want to make sure we run as accordingly as possible. I can't be kept waiting when all my passengers have places to be and the double-decker tram strode off without another word, leaving Bulgy speechless.